Happy Mother's Day, and you don't have to say it back to me because I'm not a mom, but happy Mother's Day to you for those of you who are moms and for those of you who are watching online. My mom might even be watching online this morning. If so, happy Mother's Day, mom. I love you. And if you have not had a chance to tell your mom you love her or call her if you have a mom who's still here on on this earth and you're able to, I strongly encourage you to do that. My mom's in California, so I haven't called her yet. There's a time difference, but this afternoon we will talk and I will tell her. We are gonna be continuing our series on 1 Corinthians 13, four through eight, talking about love intentionally. And we have been working through very carefully some descriptions of love. And I hope you've been following along and I hope that you have been learning or allowing God to teach you to be a little more loving, to love intentionally. We'll read 1 Corinthians 13 again together and go over it as we pick up in the sixth or seventh week of our series. I'm not 100% sure where we are. I'm having so much fun. We're just gonna keep going until we get done. But let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, four through eight together. Love is patient. How patient are you today? On a scale of one to 10, how is your patience? Um, It varies, doesn't it? Day to day, minute to minute, week to week, circumstance to circumstance. We spent a whole week talking about patience, macrothemia, being patient with people, the difficult people, the easy people, the people you know, the people you don't know. Love is kind. We spent a whole nother week talking about being kind. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not puffed up or proud. It doesn't dishonor others. That means it's not rude, that was last week. It's not self-seeking, that's this week. It's not preoccupied with serving itself. Um, It's not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Three types of love. There is the romantic sort of love, the erotic kind of love mentioned in the New Testament. There is the brotherly love between friends mentioned in the New Testament. And then there's agape love, this kind of love that is the kind of love that's not based on emotion, not based on circumstance, it's not based on feeling. It is described, not defined in 1 Corinthians 13, four through eight. Now, I've thought a lot about how to best teach this passage to you. And what I decided was that since this concept is very, very connected to some of the other concepts we've talked about, that I wanna talk to you today a little bit about the context, the history behind the book that Paul wrote or the letter that Paul wrote that we call 1 Corinthians so that you can understand what the context is or the meaning behind why he wrote what he wrote. Because sometimes it's a little hard to understand. If you read 1 Corinthians 13, then you can get some application fairly easily. If you read the entire book of 1 Corinthians, it's a little more challenging because there's some things that, well, they beg understanding. So understanding is what I'm gonna try to help you with today so that when you read 1 Corinthians, you'll understand both the city of Corinth and also this early church, this new church in Corinth in a way that helps you read scripture in an informed way and apply it to your life correctly to where when we talk about love is not self-seeking, what is it you need or what can you concede? You will have some understanding that can change your life. Corinth was a bustling city at the time of Paul's life. He arrived there on his second missionary journey after having traveled through about four other relatively significant places. He planted a church there in Corinth. Corinth was a Greek city located about 45 miles from Athens across an isthmus or a peninsula. But if you know your history, you know that the Roman Empire began from a city called Rome that became a city state that with some aggressive generals, some military leaders became an empire. And eventually for about a thousand years was one of the most prolific empires, at least we have in history. Many, many movies, books, even Shakespeare's plays are written about the Roman Empire. So in about 146 BC, Corinth was destroyed. And then about a hundred years later, a Roman emperor came along and rebuilt it and sort of annexed it into a Roman territory and um, governed by Rome, but the culture was all Greek. Now Corinth was located at a very strategic place. As a matter of fact, it was located again on an isthmus in between Southern Greece and Northern Greece. 
And there was a trade route that was um, so important that if you wanted to travel goods and services from one part of the world to the other, you had to go, well, either around the southern tip of, Cor or of Greece or across the isthmus. Now, sea captains would tell their crews, if you're going to get on this ship and we're going to go around the southern tip, around the, the Cape, the Horn of southern Greece, then you need to have your will ready because there's an 80% chance you're going to die. And so what they did was, instead of continuing to travel the dangerous waters around the southern part of Greece, they devised a plan, and I'll show you a map right now, where you can see where Corinth is located, and you can see the little isthmus, the little four-mile isthmus across. They devised a plan where it was easier and safer to take these huge ships and to roll them across the four miles. Now you see Corinth down on the bottom left-hand side there of the Isthmus, and you see Athens. Athens is over to the right. There's a little um, indicator that says to Athens, about 45 miles for us is an easy drive. For them, it was several days worth of walking. Two of the most important cities back in the Apostle Paul's day when he wrote the book or the letter to the Corinthians, but they would roll their ships across the four mile isthmus and um, stop in Corinth or near Corinth and they would resupply and they would party. Now Corinth was known as sort of the Las Vegas of the ancient world. They had a Greco-Roman society. Greek culture had won out, although Roman government was prevalent. It was made up of Roman officials, ex-soldiers, freed slaves, a handful of Jews, enough to have a synagogue, but very, you know, nobody really knows how many were there. And then people from all over the world, because as people would come through on these boats, and there were people that were traitors, there were people that were pirates, there were people that were thieves, people that were storytellers. Teachers, preachers, all kinds of different religions and magic would come through Corinth. Some would stay. They would hang out. They would live. They had districts in Corinth that were kind of like the court district downtown, only 20 times worse. I mean, it was a district that was roped off in a sense where they had legalized prostitution, brothels. I mean, they had bars everywhere. It was rowdy. It was raucous. It was tolerated. It was part of society. You had a caste system with elite Roman citizens, people who were somewhere in between, and a lot of slaves. The religion was very superstitious and mystical. The Greeks worshiped the gods. Socrates, Aristotle, and Plato had started something called natural philosophy, where they tried to explain the way the world worked outside of the workings of the gods, and they would look at individual parts of nature and try to explain the inner workings of the world, and people sort of gravitated toward different schools of thought, and they argued and debated in public forums. There were games that were held in Corinth called the Isthmian Games, named after the Isthmus that it was located on. I have a hard time saying that word, Isthmus, yeah. Isthmus, you get what I mean, right? Yeah, uh, it's not a peninsula. It looks like one, but it's connected on both ends. And it was named after that. After, it was dedicated to the, to the god Poseidon. And they held it fairly regularly. And athletes came from all over the world and crowds came from all over the world to compete. They competed in things like running, wrestling, darts, fighting. They competed naked, which was interesting. Glad our Olympics, they don't compete naked because we can watch them this summer where it would put a whole different meaning to the Olympics if they did. There was a 2,000 foot plateau that was, um, you couldn't miss it in Corinth. And on the top of the 2,000 foot plateau, there was a fort that was designed and dedicated to defend Corinth from any adversaries. And there was a temple for the goddess Aphrodite. Now there were temples for every God located in Corinth. You could find, if you had a God, they had a temple, you could find a way to worship. There was a healing God there and people would come from all over with their wounded or sick people and they would camp outside the healing temple until they found healing. And of course, many times it, it didn't work. But when, when the apostle Paul showed up you know, on, on the scene, worship and religion was just, I mean, it was just a mess. And up here on the top of the temple, in, in the temple of the goddess of fertility, there were a thousand prostitutes who were employed and people were used to walking up the temple to visit the prostitutes and they called it church or worship. And do you know that many historians talk about how the prostitutes didn't even stay up on the hill? That many times they came down into the cities to solicit business. Can you imagine how hard it would be to be moral, to be a Christian, to be a man of God when they're knocking on your door? I mean, this was a place where, 
I mean, a marketplace of ideas doesn't even begin to describe it. Culture clashes. Romans, Greeks, theater, debate, schools of philosophy, districts of debauchery, legalized prostitution, a handful of Jews trying to live, I guess, as best they could in a Jewish way. Can you imagine how they must have stood out? Then the apostle Paul shows up on the scene, tries to find Jews. There were enough to have a synagogue. That's what he did when he started a church. And he began to share the news, the truth of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And a church took root. A church took root in a city that was so corrupt. And it was a big city. Some say by the time of the apostle Paul, maybe 200,000 people, maybe more. So corrupt that it became sort of a, a, a slogan. People would say, you're living like a Corinthian. I mean, it was a difficult place. In many ways, it sounds like the culture we live in today. But this little baby church began to pop up and it began to grow. And it was like a spark that you want to take care of because at any point it could go out. And so the apostle Paul, he would just, just gently on this little church and blow and the church began to turn into a flame. But everything threatens the church. The culture around it threatened the church. The sin within the people who had become Christians threatened the church. And they were all brand new, coming out of a way of life where morality, well, it wasn't even really a thing in the way that we understand it right now. Where virtue and vice were the opposite of what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Where it could not be any more difficult in any context you could imagine to be a Christian, unless you fast forwarded a couple hundred years to the time when people, not a couple hundred, but years until the time when people's lives were being taken for calling on the name of Christ. So the apostle Paul writes a letter to this little church after he leaves. Now the church is founded in about 51 AD. And that was about the time when the emperors changed in Rome. Nero became the emperor just a few years later when Paul wrote the letter of 1 Corinthians. And you probably know the story of Nero, but Nero and the emperor didn't affect all of the territories in the Roman Empire because it was so vast, but yet a lot of the culture, the morality, the what we do and don't do, well, it was sort of passed down. And Nero was one of the worst people morally and from a judgment perspective that you could ever find. Wasn't a fan of Christians at all had a mom who was so power hungry that she tried to use her son as a puppet. Her son had a philosopher who he liked named Seneca, who he eventually killed. He eventually killed his mom. He took one of his male slaves and made that male slave his wife, married, and then ultimately committed suicide because people had had enough of him and the things that he was doing and the way that he was ruling. So the apostle Paul, he's writing this letter back to this church. And what he's trying to do is to just, just to, to fan that flame a little bit, to get that church started because these people were new. A lot of them didn't know any better. They'd been raised a certain way. Their grandparents had taught them a certain thing. They'd seen from their parents a different way to live. And this Christian thing wasn't just a little different. It was so different that it blew their minds. And the apostle Paul describes some of the things that they come out of in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Now, the word of God is a little bit like a bear hunt. Um, anybody in here know when I say bear hunt, what I mean? And I don't mean like people going to Alaska and hunting bears. I mean, like if you have a toddler, do you know what going on a bear hunt is? Can I get a show of hands if you know what going on a bear hunt is? Thank you. Going on a bear hunt is the simplest song you could ever sing. And I'm not gonna sing it for you because I don't sing well. But you go on a bear hunt and when you go on a bear hunt, you come to an obstacle. And when you come to an obstacle, right, you can't go over it. You can't go under it. You can't go around it. You have to go what? Through it, right. And you find the bears. And even when you come back, you have to go through the obstacle. Now, Emery and I, we went on unicorn hunts. We went on Bigfoot hunts. We went on all kinds of hunts. We sang the songs. We read the books. When you read the Bible, you have to read it the same way. We're going on a bear hunt. And we come to obstacles, difficult things to understand, difficult things that are countercultural, things that we don't like, that are abrasive to us. 
We don't go over it. We don't go under it. We don't go around it. We go through it. And the apostle Paul was a master of going through it. And he just puts it out there and he says it, which leads us to have to understand it and to embrace it. But he describes some of the characteristics of the way of life that these people in this church made up of rich Roman citizens, made up of people probably from all over the world, made up of freed slaves, made up of probably existing slaves. Every sort of echelon, strata, background you could imagine. Coming out of a way of life. And he says this. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, relax, because I'm a wrongdoer. You are a wrongdoer. We are wrongdoers. And this does not mean that if you ever do wrong, that you're going to go to hell. What this means is that if you live in a state or in a way where you have unconfessed known sin in your life that goes on and on and on, and you have no pangs of conscience, no desire to confess, no desire to make it right, then there's a really good chance that you're not a Christian because you've never really understood Jesus in the first place. The Holy Spirit probably hasn't indwelled your life because the Holy Spirit doesn't allow us to live in ways that are counter to the way Jesus intends. So the apostle Paul says, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. He says, neither the sexually immoral. Now he uses sexually immoral and adulterers in different ways. And it's important to know when you read 1 Corinthians and reading 1 Corinthians is your homework for this week. He says sexually immoral, uh, that would be a word that maybe we've translated fornicators. What that means, that sounds like a Saturday Night Live church lady word, doesn't it? it is a very, it's a very hard word for us to contextualize. What that means is any sexual sin that takes place outside of marriage. That's when that fornication or when the apostle Paul says sexually, sexual immorality, that's what he means. He always specifies or usually specifies adultery separate from sexual immorality because adultery would be any married spouse sleeping with somebody that's not their spouse. Does that make sense? So he specifies here the marriage relationship and then every other expression of, of sexual immorality. And we know that the way that sex is supposed to be expressed according to God is through a husband and a wife in a committed monogamous sexual relationship and that any other expression isn't what God intends for us and does not adequately represent the union and the picture that it's supposed to represent in the first place. So Paul says, neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And he says, this is what some of you were. Now he's reminding them, remember who you were and remember who you are. He's just fanning that flame. I'm rooting for you. I'm nudging you. We're gonna do this together. And he realizes they're brand new. No one's been a Christian longer than three years at this point. His expectations for them aren't that they're perfect. It's that they're willing to make the break from the world. They're willing to step apart. They're willing to live a different way. So he fans that flame in the middle of a God insulting Jesus hating, morally corrupt marketplace of the most diverse and bizarre ideas that you could ever imagine. But yet this little church, even though they're full of trouble, still continued to grow. And we're gonna talk about that in just a few minutes. We're gonna continue on our bear hunt. And I gotta tell you, the more I study about this little church, um, that um, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to, the more I love it. And I think one of the reasons is, is that I started a church in an area that's a lot like Corinth. It is different in some ways, but in some ways so similar that it's almost scary 
and that was on the West Coast. And then I actually helped start a church, a church that I pastored. We started a church in on Simon, Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. And the reason that we helped start that church was because students from all over the world came and studied at Simon Fraser. And when they did, they would study and get their degrees and then they would go back to the countries they came from and, uh, and practice whatever trade or whatever profession they learned. And for me, it was the most strategic thing we could do to try to influence an area that would eventually influence the world um, for Christ. And that's exactly what the apostle Paul was doing. He was influencing a, a city that wasn't little, a couple hundred thousand people probably, but with travelers coming through from all over the globe. And as the church began to take root, as it began to grow and the gospel began to spread, people were catching it. And they were taking it with them to places and, and Christianity began to spread to where it eventually changed all of the known world. Now, the apostle Paul, as I mentioned, is his fifth stop on his second missionary journey. Stopped in Athens and then made his way over to Corinth. And as he stopped there and started this church and spent a few years there, he left his church with a man named Apollos. After he left, just a few years after that, word came to him that there were problems in the church. There was trouble. And the trouble that was in the church, there are 10 things that the church was going through. Um, those, these are the reasons that this letter was written. Now, your homework for the week is to read 1 Corinthians. And I want you to read the entire book of 1 Corinthians. It sounds like a lot, but it's not. It's just three chapters a day, and then on the fifth day, four chapters. Or if you want to spread it out, you can go seven days and you can break it down. And I want you to read it in light of the 10 things that I'm telling you, because as you go through, there are going to be some very difficult things to understand. And I want to help you go through it and understand it, and not just understand it, but apply it and love it. And so I wanna to talk to you about the 10 things that Paul was writing about and the 10 issues that this church was facing. And remember, we're for this church, this little spark that we are fanning into a flame that the apostle Paul wants to grow. We're remembering that these are brand new Christians that have come from all sorts of backgrounds that are just, they, they aren't experienced. They don't know, they're not dumb people. They just are uninformed. So we're rooting for them. We're not criticizing them and we're seeing ourselves in them, unfortunately, probably far too often. Number one, they were fighting over which leader to follow. Now, without spending too much time over this, Apollos was the next pastor that Paul left in the church. And there were people who were used to following politicians and philosophers. And so they divided their church into camps, like following a staff member or a former pastor or a deacon or a family in the church and dividing and splitting the church and fighting. And it was terrible. And the apostle Paul said, stop it, unity, right? Don't be self-seeking. Number two, some of the Christians, or at least one Christian, was practicing incest. Now, this takes a little bit more explanation to, because um, it's, it's very shocking when you hear this. Again, the word of God, it can be hard to read and to understand, but we're going to go right through it. There was a man in the church at Corinth who had fallen in love with his father's wife, his stepmom. And the language teaches us three things in this particular excerpt that you can read on your own, and I hope you do this week. Number one, that he had fallen in love with, or they had had a sexual attraction to his father's wife, that his father's wife had divorced the father, the father had divorced the wife, and that was in the language that was used, not adultery, but sexual immorality in the description of the incident. And the language also tells us from the present tense that it was an ongoing, long-standing, tolerated relationship. So there was somebody in the church who was living with his former stepmom and they were in a sexual relationship. And the apostle Paul said, you've got to stop. And he said to the church, you can't put up with it. You can't allow this to go unchecked. Now, Paul even said the Gentiles have outlawed this because it was illegal to get in the middle of somebody else's marriage. It's immoral, unethical, but it was illegal. And that was just the second thing that this church was facing. It was the sin, but it was the harboring of the sin. The third thing, many were suing each other. Now they had turned lawsuits into a sport. In the Greek culture, 
when you sued somebody and you could sue them over anything. I don't like your face. You could sue them, right? You blew your grass in my driveway. I could sue you, right? I mean, you, uh, whatever I wanted to do. Now, you didn't have lawyers in Greek culture. And that was Roman rule. If it was serious, you went to a Roman magistrate. But oftentimes, the petty things were tried in the streets, according to Greek custom. And you didn't have a lawyer. You hired a speechwriter. And the speechwriter would write you an eloquent speech on all the bad characteristics of somebody you were trying to sue and all the reasons you should win. And you would have a jury of sometimes up to 500 people and you would try air your grievances and try your case in the middle of the public squares and talk about how bad the other person is and how you should win. And it was a big sport. Everybody would clap for you and boo for the other guy. And Paul said, you Christians are airing your grievances, your petty grievances in public. Shame on you. Handle these things among yourselves. Doesn't mean that you never have to take somebody to court. Paul himself appealed to Roman law as a citizen and legally freed himself from a situation where he was being unfairly accused. But Paul said, stop it, grow up. Stop airing your petty grievances one another in the court of public opinion. Stay off Facebook, quit telling your neighbors, handle it. Why be so self-serving? Number four, sexual immorality was tolerated because it was occurring outside the body and they thought it didn't matter. Now, let me tell you once again how sex worked back then. <laughs> well, you know how sex works, right? I don't have to tell you that. Um, that would be a whole different message for a different day. Let me tell you how it worked back then, how they, how they viewed sex and marriage. Here's how they viewed it. A woman would be married if she was of a class to be married, oftentimes a Roman citizen or someone with money. The marriages were arranged by the parents. It was always political or almost always and very rarely for love. Oftentimes the woman married at 12 years old. The man was usually twice her age, sometimes more than twice her age. When they were married, they were put together. It was arranged. And the woman up until 12 years old was almost always kept inside the house. She was forbidden from drinking alcohol. Now, those are probably two good things if you're trying to stay a virgin as they were trying to keep these girls to stay a virgin. They kept them locked up and away from alcohol. I think that's a great policy. We should instill that right now in our youth group. Um, it's, it's not contextual. It's, this is what they did back in their culture. Women didn't have any rights. They were treated as property, which I wholeheartedly disagree with, as does Jesus and, believe it or not, the Apostle Paul. But these women were kept inside till they were given to their husbands. The husbands would procreate, they would consummate the marriage. And many times writers would say that in these marriages, they were loveless. Um, the only time they would come together again physically was when they were having children. And other than that, the woman was um, too bad, so sad by herself, unable to have relationships with anybody else, but not able to be with her husband in that way. Now men could be with anybody they wanted to except the married woman. They could be with a girlfriend. They could have, you know, a, a special friend. They could have slaves. Slaves in Paul's, in, in this culture, first century culture, had no rights over their bodies. And so if you owned a slave, you could force them, male or female, to have relations with you anytime you wanted to. And the Greeks believed that sex was outside the body, that it didn't matter. It was just an urge and could be satisfied however you wanted it to be satisfied. And the apostle Paul said, no, you have to understand it has nothing to do with just satisfying an urge it has to do with a beautiful picture that God has given and an act or an event that a husband and wife in a monogamous relationship do together that's beautiful, should be often, and done out of love. And they were learning because it was new for them, but it was mind blowing. I mean, it, it just, it was hard for them to wrap their minds around. There was confusion about marriage and singleness. When you read this, you're gonna to come to this passage and you're gonna go, wait a second, stop. The apostle Paul, he says, better to be single. And everybody's like, what? Well, sometimes it is better to be single. And he says, but if you have to get married because you're burning with passion, go ahead and get married. You know, and it sounds like he doesn't like women at all. It sounds like the apostle Paul's kind of grouchy. And, and I'm not sure that he's grouchy, but people have different ideas about why he says this. And he even says, you know, this is me speaking, it's my opinion. But some people think that the apostle Paul, back before he became a Christian, when he was Saul, that he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. And if he was, he would have had to have certainly been married and if either had or been on the way to have children. If so, at some point, by the time he wrote this, he did not have a wife, which means that his wife may have, according to Jewish law, when Paul became a heretic, becoming a Christian, could have left him and been protected by Judaism, and Paul could have been separated from his family, could have. Some other people believe 
that Paul's wife may have gone with him into ministry and at some point died because there are other times in scripture where he writes, we can bring our wives along with us. Very compelling, but not conclusive. Some people think he was never married and not a member of the Jewish ruling council. But he says, better to be single because you can focus on ministry. And some people have the gift of singleness and they do. And it's a beautiful gift. And he's saying, focus, focus, focus. How much could you get done if you're not worried about a spouse? And then he says, for some, God's called them to be married. But there was confusion about marriage and singleness. And so some people were like, well, since we don't really have sex in our marriages and we can't have sex with anybody else, why would we even be married? So we should divorce our spouse. Everybody should be single. They were going back and forth from one side to the other. I don't know what guy said, there's no sex, should be no sex. We're not gonna have, and wants to just get rid of all women. I would definitely leave his small group if he were my teacher. That's not a very popular teaching. The apostle Paul smacks his head and he's like, no, no. It's a good thing, but it has to be in context, God's context. But these are new people. They're just getting it, right? Fan that flame, it's okay to be new. It's not okay to stay new. Well, they were eating food offered to idols. I spent two weeks talking about that when I talked about boycotting Target and Bud Light and how we don't do that. And if we do, we don't talk about it. Remember those days? And the into the issue was simple. Paul said, listen, be careful of your other brothers and sisters, Christian conscience. Look out for the weaker brother. Try not to do anything that's, that's gonna scandalize a weaker brother and hurt them in their faith. Pretty simple. Sounds a little bit like not being self-seeking, doesn't it? Um, this is an interesting one. Number seven, should a woman's head be covered in church? And um, I have seen this couple of times. Have you ever seen this? You ever been in a church where women cover their heads? You ever been in a church? Okay. No big deal if they do, right? But um, this was a custom and it was a Corinthian custom. Now I pastored a church on the West Coast, the church that reminds me a lot of Corinth. And um, there was a woman in the church who read 1 Corinthians and she read it literally. She said, woman has to have her head covered in church. So she's going to cover her head. And so when we had church, after we got done singing, she would whip out this handkerchief, like a doily with the little things on the outside, not just a handkerchief. And she would put it on her head and she would cover her head and everybody around her would look at her and they would go, what are we supposed to cover our heads? It stood out and, and it caused sort of, um, well, I mean, it was hard to explain. Now there are denominations that cover their heads. There are people who've done this as a tradition or a custom, but it's certainly not biblical. The principle is that men, when they worship idols, in Corinth covered their heads as part of their worship, that a woman was supposed to in this culture have her head covered as a part of modesty. And a married woman saying that she was married and taken, like wearing a ring, not wanting to date around. And the translatable principle is that women are supposed to be conscientious of the fact that we live in a world where Men are visual and easily distracted. And you wouldn't want to do anything to draw someone else's attention away from the Lord and onto you in a way that could even be perceived as sexually inappropriate. Be modest. Now, I don't say be prudish. Some cultures have taken it to the extreme where they legislate it, where your hymns have to be all the way to the floor and your necklines have to be all the way up to here because men are such fragile creatures. We can't even look upon them. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? But it's like, listen, this is the principle. Realize that we're responsible for each other and cover yourself if you can. That's all. Every guy in here would say, all right, amen, thank you. We can focus on God, not on who's next to us. The apostle Paul was saying, be courteous. Be or don't be self-seeking. Well, rich Christians were abusing the Lord's Supper. We talk about this a lot. But they were dividing themselves into cliques. You ever been to a clicky church where you walk in and you just feel like you didn't belong? I hope that that is not your experience here. We friends are one big clique and you belong here. If you come and you want to be here, you are part of the family. There is no in crowd. There is no out crowd. There is nobody that's going to be standing in a corner talking about you, whether you are brand new, whether you haven't even become a believer in the first place and are thinking about it, or whether you've been down this road for 30 or 40 years. This is your family and you belong here. But in this church, they were already dividing themselves up according to socioeconomic status, according to families and friendships, according to their backgrounds, perhaps. 
and they were having parties. They were making the Lord's Supper a party. They were making church services or small groups, cliquish, excluding other people, new people or people who weren't like them. And the apostle Paul had to write about it because my goodness, the world is bad enough, isn't it? In excluding, compartmentalizing, labeling, judging. There is no place for that in the church. So Paul covers it. Well, some people were prioritizing some spiritual gifts over another. They were talking about how their gift is better. I can teach better than you. I can prophesy better than you. They were praying in tongues over the top of each other. It was causing chaos. And Paul said, listen, we got to be decent and we have to be orderly. Quit competing with each other. Nobody wins unless we all win. And then finally, there is a theological controversy, which is probably one of the more minor controversies within the body, but important ultimately for our theology. And that is that they were worried that when they died, that their souls may go to heaven, but their bodies wouldn't. So the apostle Paul writes about how the body, earthly body, tainted by sin. We get old, you look in the mirror one day and you're like, all right. And you look in the mirror a year later and you're like, huh, what happened, right? And every year you look and go, something else happened. And eventually we don't look in the mirror anymore because we're dead. That's what happens to the body. And that's what Paul says. And he goes, it's just a tent. And you leave your tent behind. But one day your tent's gonna be restored and resurrected and it will be perfect and without sin. And and he's telling them and they're going, and their minds are just blown. But it's because they're new. And so Paul says, okay, 10 reasons why he wrote this letter. Now let's read 1 Corinthians 3, 4 through, or 13, 4 through 8 in light of what I've just told you one more time and see if it helps you read this any differently, understanding that there's friction when any groups of people get together, that there's misunderstanding and that with new ideas and concepts that you have never heard before and that you haven't been taught or seen modeled, that when, they, when, they, when you're told to do these things, well, it's hard. And it takes some time. The apostle Paul is not describing or defining love as much as he is applying it to this church. He says, love is patient. Be patient with each other as I am patient with you. Paul sometimes doesn't seem real patient in his writing, which kind of scares me a little bit. It's like, well, I wouldn't want to get a letter from that guy. But I think when you read behind the, the scenes and see his heart, he's exceptionally patient. He says, love is kind. Just be kind. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not proud. I'm not better than you. You're not better than the person next to you. It doesn't matter what's in the bank account or what car you drove in and what neighborhood we live in or where we came from or how many degrees we have or what job you have or anything else. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And that should make us humble. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It isn't easily angered. That's a good one. You guys are going to love that one when we get to that one next week. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. And everybody in this little church is like, huh, this seems hard. And the apostle Paul responds, my paraphrase, yeah, it's hard, but it's worth it. And do you know what? You and I started January 1, 2024, a journey together to be transformed so that this year, by the time we get to the end of the year, we look back and we are different people. And you and I might not have looked like this at all in January, but if you stay with me and much more importantly than with me, if you stay with the word, and you keep allowing God to do the work in your life, you are gonna look a lot like this. And that's what I want. Now, what do you need and what can you concede? I wanna show you a picture. My little granddaughter, Emery, love her, two and a half. That's Emery right there. Um, You know, you have granddaughters and so I'm not gonna ask you to say that mine's the cutest one in the world. I know she is. I just, I don't want you to, 
this picture has nothing to do with my illustration. I just wanted you to see little Emery sitting in the back of my truck and uh, she's got a little flower necklace on. Now, Emery is selfish. She is, she's self-seeking. She's two and a half, self-seeking. She is, especially when she eats. Um, I'll show you the next picture here. Uh, this is Emery and, you know, Joy and I, again, we were responsible for a week of keeping her alive and all the things you have to do to keep little kids alive and feeding them was one of them. And she didn't love the food that, we, that I gave her. I mean, she ate what I ate and I uh, didn't eat the kind of stuff she wanted to eat. I gave her like chicken and, you know, lean pork and stuff. And so Emery, um, at mealtime, Emery walks around the table and eyeballs everybody's plate, everybody else. And her eyes are just like right above the table because she's two and a half. And she walks around and she looks at a plate. And if she sees something she wants, she does this like that. And she expects you to put it in her hand. So I did. I gave her whatever she wanted. And she'd go to my wife and she would look at her plate and she would go, mmm like that. And Joy would give her what she wanted. And she would circle the table. And she was so self-seeking and so selfish and didn't concede anything. She demanded everything. And that's okay because she's new. She's two and a half. You expect two and a half year olds to act like they're two and a half. But it's a problem if they're 15 and walking up to your plate and doing this, right? Love is not self-seeking. It's not all about the self. So this week, I want you to read 1 Corinthians. And I want you to read the whole book. It will not take you that long. And you are going to come to some sections that are gonna make you go, huh. And I want you to read it with the 10 issues in mind that I've explained to you that chronologically will take you through the book and the context of the city of Corinth controlled by the Roman Empire with all of the different things that were going on. And then think about this, 1 Corinthians 13, four through eight, and see if its meaning changes in your heart and in your mind just a little bit. This week, let's practice a love that is not self-seeking. Father, thank you so much for my friends who are here. It just occurs to me, Father, that so many are new. And I love that. I'm grateful for that, Father. So many brand new Christians, so many listening online, so many maybe having returned to a faith after having left for whatever reason, maybe years ago. And as we are new, Father, we appreciate the space and the time to listen, to soak it in, and to learn. For those of us who aren't new, we confess to you the ways we fail you and how unloving we can be, how self-serving we can be, conceding nothing to the people around us but wanting the first, wanting the best, wanting to win. And I pray that we as a congregation would love each other in the way that the apostle Paul was instructing this brand new church, that you would make us loving people as you transform us, changing us into the people you want for your glory so that the world around will see how much of a difference you make. I love my friends, Father but you love them more than I do. And it's with that confidence that I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.